the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, ramming duel, tactical briefing, La Royale changes, and Metal Beasts, multi-role wheeler. We took off to the skies in the last episode's Metal Beasts, and now it's time to cover some ground. The La Royale update brings a whole bunch of new ground vehicles. All of them can boast some great traits, but today's guest is one of the more remarkable machines. Please welcome a new top Italian wheeled multi roll IFV, the Freccia. Its main caliber is a two plane stabilized 25mm autocannon with elevation angles between minus 10 and plus 60 degrees. It's also equipped with two launchers for spike ATGMs and a machine gun. Eight smoke launchers are found on the turret as well. The engine and transmission compartment is in the front. The driver sits right next to it, while the commander and the gunner sit in the turret. The focus of this new vehicle is its combat module. War Thunder tankers must be familiar with the 25mm autocannon, since it's the very same weapon used by the Dardo that we once called a nail gun. It's still just as good at piercing enemy sides, and its high rate of fire helps you handle opponents without spending too much time in the sights. Now, guided missiles are what we want to focus on here. They're by no means unique, since a Chinese event machine has similar weaponry. Still, it's pretty exciting to see another one. The Spike missile's main advantage is its fire and forget capability. All you need to do is pick a target for the homing device. The ordnance will calculate the route and follow it on its own, with no aid required. More than that, the target doesn't have to be on the ground. The Spike can lock onto flying objects as well. We need to admit that they don't always have enough dynamics to hit planes, but they're pretty dangerous for helicopters. Besides, no sensor would be able to warn the chopper about this nasty present. Another difference with the Chinese vehicle is the wheeled base of the Italian machine. Its name means arrow in English, and it's pretty suitable for the agility it can show. The Freccia is so fast it can get to major strategic positions first in a battle and wreak some havoc before anyone has a chance to grasp what's going on. And you can launch the spikes on the go. With all that in mind, we've got to say that the tactics for this machine might be tricky, but fun. It's not meant for facing enemy tanks like a lone warrior. It's more like Figaro here, Figaro there. Basically, it's sticking its nose everywhere it can. It might break a duel or two, help an ally on the go, and then retreat, cruising for a bruising. And in between those bruisings, it can also throw some ATGMs at the helis. What can we say? It's so much fun, especially when you need a break from all those conventional top tier vehicles. It was the 31st of May, 1938, and the Hanko raid was off the rails. Yes, the Japanese Imperial Navy pilots had expected some anti-air defenses. The bravest had hoped for the Chinese to use some American-made fighters so that they could have some fun with them. What they got was a major blowback instead. Seemingly out of nowhere, an entire swarm of I-16s with Chinese insignia flew in, and the Japanese bombers started dropping like flies. The defenders didn't even try to avoid combat with the Japanese escort fighters. On the contrary, they were leading their own offense. The remaining bombers had already dropped their loads and turned back, but the fierce dogfight was still on. The sky over Hanko saw dizzying maneuvers performed by I-16 and Mitsubishi aircraft. While the citizens sought cover from the constant machine gun volleys, the brave military observers continued marking planes downed by each side. Soon, the fighters used up their fuel and started their retreats east or west depending on the side. There was only one I-16 left, too stubborn to drop the pursuit. It didn't fire. It must have been out of ammo. The remaining Mitsubishi seemed to have the same issue. At first, the Japanese pilot wanted to just ignore the stubborn fighter and fly to Shanghai. But soon, he had to make a sharp evasive turn. The I-16 went for a ramming. What happened after was a battle unlike any other. 
The Chinese and Japanese fighters made dizzy turns, met and parted in scissors, slowed down to almost stalling speeds, and sped away. Each fought for an advantage, a good position for a ramming where they'd break the opponent's tail with their prop or use their own wing to damage the other's propeller. Some say the pilots even used their revolvers in midair. That would have been wild, even for World War I. As a reminder, those aircraft were high-speed monoplanes. Neither of the pilots actually needed to ram the enemy. A simple error would be enough to become fatal near the ground, with no time to regain altitude and correct the course. But neither of them wanted to make that mistake, of course. This madness couldn't last long. The I-16 finally got to the A-5M and cut off a piece of its wing with the prop. The Japanese fighter made a spinning dive and flew out of sight, behind some hills. Meanwhile, the I-16 reduced acceleration and turned west to Yichang, accompanied by acclamatory shouts from the ground observers. The Soviet volunteer pilot, Senior Lieutenant Anton Gubenko, successfully reached his airbase and later received awards from both China and the Soviet Union. A few days later, he would use a spare I-15 to get back to combat and achieve quite a few more victories. What about the Japanese pilot? The Chinese observers considered him downed and even found some aircraft remains. But who could tell if those were really his among so many destroyed that day in Hanko? The Japanese reports state that Officer Kasimura joined the Hanko raid that day on his Mitsubishi A5M, survived a duel with an I-16 at low altitude, and lost a huge chunk of his wing as a result of enemy ramming. The aircraft entered a spin, but Kasimura managed to level it on time and made it to Shanghai, where he performed an emergency landing on the airfield. The command even scolded him for spending his ammo too fast. Was that the true way those events unfolded? It's been too long to know for sure. The La Royale update brought a whole number of changes to the game. Some may seem unimportant at first, others more significant, but we're sure players want to know what's going on. Let's see what changed in War Thunder. We'll start with the custom loadouts. We've been working on extending the list of aircraft with this capability. You ask us about it pretty often, so more than 70 additional planes and helicopters received their own custom loadouts. And we're working on adding more. Moreover, we've been working on the weapon selection available to many machines. We've told you about retarded bombs before, but we haven't mentioned the number of aircraft receiving them. It's actually almost a hundred planes. And there's more. We've extended the arsenals of some aircraft, added separate bomb drops, reworked the free sets. With so many changes, we could go on for a long time. Speaking of weapons, there's another major change here. Many ATGMs and SAMs employing the three-point method were switched to a new physical guidance model that does a better job at replicating their real-life flight paths. Moreover, we've also improved the flight models and autopilots for guided bombs and air-to-surface missiles. Visual changes deserve a mention, too. We've reworked or improved quite a number of things. For instance, each and every missile enjoys new effects now. It's easy to spot this change if you look at the new jet streams and engine trails. Hypersonic missiles now feature shock diamonds, while wire-guided ATGMs can finally show the wires. Sure, those changes do nothing to the actual gameplay, but they do add to the realism. Pilots of top-tier aircraft might be happy to see the new afterburner effects, the new flares, and of course the new bailout animations. By the way, ejection seats have also been added to the camo of helicopters. This process is truly unique. First, the main rotor blades are shot out, then, the explosive charges in the canopy are set off, and only then does the rocket in the seat deploy, which, unlike the aircraft systems, ejects just the pilots, leaving their seats inside the falling machine. Ground vehicles got some functional changes in addition to visuals. We've reworked the impact effects, so high explosive shells leave both hit marks and shrapnel traces. If you look closer at a hit made by a late finned round, you can actually make out the fins. 
damaged radiators will now spew white steam clouds made by boiling liquids. If you don't fix them on time, your engine might overheat and stop working. Moreover, there's new lines for tank crews, making your War Thunder experience even more immersive. Target hit! Target hit! By the way, your feedback helps us push fixes quicker. We're already working on those lines. Thank you for your help. And finally, let's talk about the Navy. We've reworked the damage mechanics for large ships. Their crews are now mostly found in the Citadel, while armored modules have become more valuable. This will help in a situation where major damage is dealt by hitting the crew stationed outside armored areas, like those manning auxiliary calibers on the upper deck or right below it. Tell us in the comments what changes you like the most. Actually, don't be shy about telling us what else you'd like to see improved. We're looking forward to your input. And now, it's time for us to answer some of the questions you asked us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Angel Joyce. Which is better, the Panther D or the Panzer 470? Hi, Joyce. It wouldn't be fair to compare machines that are so different. Still, we'd say the Panther has better mobility and more versatility, while the Panzer 470 has fewer vulnerabilities. Mr. Bomber asks, what skills should I prioritize when training all crew types? Hey there, we dedicated sections to each type of crew in episodes 302, 305, and 312. Check them out. Another question comes from Shadow Killer. Why was the White Rock Fortress map removed? Hi, Shadow Killer. This map is under renovation at the moment, don't you worry. The same happened with the Kuban and Volokolamsk maps before. Stryker asks, can you do a triathlon for early jet bombers? Hi there, Stryker. That's a great idea, but we don't have enough planes for a full triathlon. If we include later bombers, their stats would be way too far ahead. And the last comment for today was written by Random Guy. What's the fastest jet in War Thunder, and can it outrun any guided missile while flying horizontally? Hey, Random Guy, the fastest jet at the moment is the new F-14. Much like many other jets, it can easily outrun some slower guided missiles. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to count the fins on your shells, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.